Good morning. Good morning. Awesome time of worship today in the Lord's house. And it's a real blessing to be here with you guys today. Um, I'm very, very excited about sharing what God's put on my heart um, this morning. Um, uh, this is a, a last teaching of the elders. Pastor Joe will be, and Isaac will be back next week, um, back on the pulpit. But it's a blessing that we're able to um, uh, wait on the Lord and hear what he has to say. Um, I started out by saying a couple of weeks ago, and some of you guys know this story, so be patient with me. Um, something happened to me as we were getting set to leave California, which kind of gave me an entire outlook on this study. Something that actually was intended to re really draw closer to the Lord. And, um, but the thing is, I'm not going to tell you right now. I'm going to leave that for the ending when we close. And then I'll share it. And then I think you're going to see what God was trying to show me and hopefully showing us. <clears throat> so today we're going to be in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. So if you turn there in your Bibles, and if anyone needs a Bible today, raise your hand and our ushers can give you one. I'm looking around, looking around, and everybody's good. Okay. Okay. No hands up, praise the Lord. We all got our Bibles. Um, so John, the last, I'm going to give you a little background before we start. John was one of the last surviving uh, apostles. Wrote these three letters, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the book of Revelation, pretty late in his life. Um, along the way, several attempts were made to kill him including being dipped into a cauldron of hot oil. Um, and these attempts all failed. You know, God had other plans for John. He wasn't finished with them yet. Um, so before we get to the main text this morning, I'd like to give you a kind of a brief outline up there. You'll see it if you're taking notes um, of First John and give you the kind of five reasons why he wrote this letter two of which we're going to be kind of discussing at length today. Um, now, at the time of this writing, Gnosticism was sweeping through the early church, and Gnostics believing, among other things, that all material things, including the body, were evil. Thus claiming that Jesus, the Christ, would never put himself into something as evil as a fleshly body. Now, and that's a whole other study. We're not doing that today. John wanted to reestablish some simple but vital truths to the church. And number one, verse one, chapter three, to bring fellowship between the believers and fellowship between the believers and God. Number two, chapter one, verse four, that our joy would be full, our joy being in Jesus himself. Number three, chapter two, verse one, that we may not sin. A relationship with Jesus can and should result in a life of obedience and righteousness. Ch uh, number four, reason number four, chapter two, verse 26, warning us about false teachers that are among us. In John's time, it was the Gnostics. And in our time, well, you can kind of take your pick. Um, reason number five, that we know we have eternal life through Jesus. In other words, the assurance of salvation. So now let's turn to 1 John, and uh, we're going to read, or I will read, and you can follow along in your Bibles, um, the four verses we, uh, God chose today. Um, chapter 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father 
and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. And we'll stop there. And you're thinking, all right, only four verses today. But in a couple hours, we'll see how that all works out. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. Um, so, we already can see some similarities in between the opening verse of 1 John and the Gospel of John. In 1 John, that which was from the beginning. In the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Um, always really, John reminding us that God, Jesus, and the Word were all there in the beginning. And really, elevating the Word on an equality with Jesus. You, you can't have one without the other. You can't take one without the other. They're all the same. As I said, the Word was God and is God. Now here's a couple of verses that kind of back that up and that show us Jesus and the Word are the same. John 1, well, I'm, I'm just going to read it to you, 14, but we'll get there. Um, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And Revelation, if you're taking notes, you can write these down. Revelation 19, 11 through 13. I'm just going to read that. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, he had a name written that no one knew except himself. Verse 13, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So those are two scriptures that back this up, what John is giving in John 1.1 1, 1 and 1 John 1. So I think that's pretty awesome that when we hold this book, we're actually holding the Lord here. You know, this is, this is the Lord's Word. This is him. We can fellowship with Jesus through this. And we're going to get into that a little bit as we get into uh, verse by verse here. Um, John, in verse 1 here, I've got to flip back. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life, and the word of life being Jesus, right? His word. Um... John is telling us, hey, we, I was an eyewitness. I was there. I, I, I saw the Lord. I heard the Lord. We touched the Lord. He was with him the whole time for when he began his earthly ministry. A witness to all things Jesus. Now, you can imagine yourself living in a village, possibly, a little town where maybe later in life before John was thrown on that island, exiled, that maybe he would come and teach. You know, put yourself there. Here's the last surviving apostle, there at the beginning, the last physical link there with Jesus, right? Imagine a sign out there, you know, on the marquee out inside the temple or the church, you know. You know, it's like, one night only, the son of thunder, John the apostle. <sighs> All in neon and flashing lights and stuff. No, there was no neon back then. But you can imagine, that must have been a tough seat to get. And as special a time as it was for John, being with Jesus, he's giving us a message here. He's telling us that we didn't have to be there 2,000 years ago to be an eyewitness to Jesus Christ. Because of his word, we can also see and hear when we hear the Lord and touch the person of Jesus. Every time we open up this book, his word is available to all who desire, all who hunger, and all who thirst. Jesus, the holy righteous one, the word of life. Proverbs 30, verse 5 says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Every word of God is pure. No fillers, no preservatives. Hebrews 4.12 
says, and I'm just going to read part of this, for the word of God is living and powerful. <laughs> These weren't words just written down from a long time ago. They have been alive since the beginning and continue to live today. Now, last week, um, Pete was sharing with us um, um, among one of the slides was the Mayflower Compact. Um, uh, the time of the pilgrims coming over from England. But, you know, we start thinking about the reason why they came over here. They were being persecuted by the Church of England, and they wanted to worship the God of the Bible. They wanted just a pure relationship with Jesus, right? And so they had to flee to Holland, go into caves. They were being hunted down. They had to go from place to place to place, you know, and they finally went back to England and hopped aboard the Mayflower, and they came over, and all they wanted to do was worship the God of the Bible. And uh, you probably couldn't see unless you were like in the first front rows, but if you remember the first name on that list was a guy by the name of uh, Governor William Bradford. The word Bradford should be a dead giveaway, right? Isaac believes that guy is one of his direct descendants. Um, He's actually one of my descendants, too. So I said, hey, Isaac, we're really related. And, um, but he's a direct descendant. I'm in by a couple of marriages there. But it's just interesting to know when we see this, it's like, you know, four or 500 years later that the word of God is still being preached by a Bradford. And I think that's just, what a legacy to carry on, isn't it? Oh, that's just awesome. Now, we were um, talking about a guy in VBS in our teacher's devotional every day by the name of William Tyndale. And uh, right around that same time period, he was a guy who was scholared in uh, Greek and Hebrew. And he was uh, busy translating the Greek and Hebrew into English. There was only one problem with that. You weren't allowed to do it. Uh, you actually was under the penalty of death to do something like that. Only someone like a bishop in a church could actually even read um, the Bible to people. Well, unfortunately, they weren't very well trained in the Bible and, and they were spinning off in different directions. But William Tyndale's desire was to translate the Word of God so everybody can read it. But he also, like the pilgrims, you know, before they came over here, was being hounded and persecuted and followed all over the place. And he would go from place to place to place and he would continue to translate. Um, he translated the entire New Testament, about half of the Old Testament, before they finally caught him and executed him. A guy by the name of uh, Miles Coverdale actually picked up where he left off and finished the last half of the Old Testament. And you can actually look it up. You can get a Tyndale Bible today. You can Google it and, and find it at, on Amazon <laughs> probably. And, uh, and so his translation years later still exists. And it's like, you can't stop God's word. It's going to persevere, right? It's, you can't shut it down. And this guy sacrificed his life so that others could just read the word of God. I think that's so awesome. Um, very, very cool. Um, because he wanted God's word to change lives, that it changed his. And I know it's changed my life. I didn't come along and believe in Jesus because it was the right thing to do or I saw people doing something. It was because the word of God, when I actually heard it, almost really for the first time in my life, it really transformed me and, and, and started doing something different inside me. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. And, uh, and I know that's not unique. I know God's word changed your life too. Amen? Verse 2. Um, the life was manifested... And we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Okay. Um, Jesus' life was manifested or, say another way, revealed and shown to his disciples. They lived with him. They ate with him. Bore witness to his three-year ministry. They saw him transfigured. They saw his miracles. Um, they saw him die. They saw him resurrected. And they saw him ascend into heaven. A great many more things that were written 
in the Gospels. John wrote the last line of his Gospel, verse 25. He wrote, And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. Eternal life was revealed to them, but it wasn't meant for them only. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. They bore witness and now declare to the world that which they have seen. In Acts 4.20, it says, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. They were compelled to do that. They were told to do that. And we think about exclusive things, you know. Uh, there's really too much of that in the world right now anyway. You know, even if you go to, like, a, a grocery stores, uh, no offense, Michael, you have to join their club to get the lower price, right? You don't have that card, you don't get the lower price. So it's kind of an exclusive thing, but we have too much of that in the world. Um, I thank God his word's available to everyone, free of charge. Price has already been paid. Everybody can get one. Um, the last recorded message to his disciples in Acts 1 was to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The apostles doing what they were told and proclaiming Jesus to the entire world. This good news was never meant to be secret, never meant to keep to ourselves. The church would have died out in that first generation if things, these things were kept private. But God's word continues to move on year after year. Praise the Lord. We're moving over to verse 3. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. That you may have fellowship with us. John speaks of us having fellowship with them, and we can do that by obviously reading the word. But let's talk about having fellowship with one another here. That's why we're here. We're here together, sinners in need of a Savior. We worship together, we listen to the word together, we pray together, we eat together, serve together, and sometimes we even grieve together. And our grief is softened because we do it together. No one is excluded. All are welcome. And, and that's one thing I love about this church. It embraces the troubled, the hurting, the wounded. This is the Lord's hospital where people come to get better, to get healed. And in fellowship together, we also get to benefit from all the spiritual gifts that God has given each one of us. Everyone working together for the glory of God. Whatever gift you have, whatever gift you possess, whatever gift God has given you, without it being used, then we're not getting the full complement of blessing we could receive, right? You know, the church will suffer because there are gifts out there not being displayed. We want to be blessed. I want to be blessed. But the common reason that we are here, the common reason why we fellowship is because we want to fellowship with Jesus. Amen? That's the payday, being with Jesus. Out of all the things that God created in those first six days, he desires fellowship with us. It's amazing. So much so that he sent his son down on earth to die for our sins so we could have a way to be with him. Now God created the earth and the universe in six days. Everything was done in six days. 
But I say that his work wasn't truly completed until that afternoon at Calvary. As John says in chapter 19, verse 30, the last thing Jesus uttered was, it is finished. The work is done. It's complete. Nothing more needs to be done. We have our way of fellowshipping with Jesus forever now. Now, we know why Jesus came to us. We just talked about that. He came to die for our sins so we could have fellowship with him. And you may have asked yourself sometime in your life, usually it's something someone young will say, and uh, maybe there's even someone here today asking this question, what is the meaning of life? Or why am I here? Why didn't God put me here? What's my purpose? What is it I'm supposed to do? Well, the simple answer really is we're here for the purpose of having fellowship and intimacy with God. Now, those of you over 50 will have an easier time remembering this. Um, there was an English pop group. Don't worry, I'm not leaving the younger ones out. I'll get to you later. The <laughs> English pop group called the Bee Gees, the Brothers Gibb. I'm sure everybody remembers those guys. Um, very popular in what I call the dreaded disco era. You know, and, it, and the reason I don't like it is because I, I, I don't dance. So, you know, to me, I had no purpose behind that music. You know, I was a rock and roller, man. That, that was what I was at. But uh, anyway, over the course of the last, I don't know, five or ten years, two of the brothers have died, leaving only one. And a few years ago, I read an article, and it was a review of his solo concert at the Hollywood Palladium. And he was bemoaning the loss of his brothers and him being the lone survivor. And he was asking the audience what the purpose of life was. And here, this guy's got all the fame. He has all the money, fortune, everything. He's got it all, right? And he has no idea what the purpose of life is. All these number one hits, you know, uh, he was very popular. And everybody loved his music, and still he had nothing. He had no clue. Um, on September 28th, um, there's going to be a movie out um, called Steve McQueen, Story of an American Icon. And it's an untold story that definitely Hollywood isn't going to tell you, but uh, Harvest, uh, um, uh, Greg Laurie's uh, church that he pastors at, uh, um, produced this movie about Steve McQueen, how Steve McQueen actually accepted the Lord on the last part of his life. Well, here's a guy who, he had it all, you know, money, fame, whatever. And uh, the next thing on his list was, I think I'm going to learn how to fly a plane. So he takes flying lessons. Well, the pilot happened to be a Christian. So I'm ruining the movie for you, right? <laughs> happened to be a Christian. You have to go down to the valley to go see it, though. So... Um, and so he started listening to this pilot, and he started attending this guy's church. And the next thing you know, he talks with the pastor, and Steve McQueen, born again. And um, shortly after that, he got sick, and uh, was in Mexico to undergo some uh, special treatment, and called uh, Billy Graham, and Billy Graham flew out to talk to him. And Steve McQueen had misplaced his Bible, so Billy Graham gave him his Bible. Signed it, here you go, you know. It was short after the surgery, it wasn't successful, and Steve McQueen died shortly thereafter. And when they found him, they found him clutching that Billy Graham Bible right on his heart. He had Jesus, the word of life, right on his heart, and that's how they found him. And I think that's a, such an awesome story. He finally found Jesus that filled his empty life. I was even watching something the other night, and this is for you younger guys. Um, it was a lead singer of a, a band called the Smashing Pumpkins. Anybody remember that? And anyway, the lead singer, what a name, right? That's kind of a cool name. But the lead singer said, you know, I really thought all this fame and fortune was going to fill my life. And he says, I'm as empty now having all this fame and fortune as I ever was. And I, saw, I just saw this the other night on, on, on a historical thing. And I thought, wow, here's another example of you can have it all. And you don't have Jesus, you got nothing. 
right? Um, these guys just didn't have a clue. Unless we have that close personal relationship, we don't have anything. So now, why does John write to us concerning the subject of, of fellowship and the word? And really my kind of main point today uh, is six little verses in verse 4, six little words in verse 4, that our joy may be full. Okay, and you ask, okay, what is our joy? Jesus is our joy. The outside world is not capable of providing true and lasting joy in our heart. This joy can only come through an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Far too often, we seek our joy or happiness with things in the outside world, um, or even people. You know, we let situations in our life dictate our happiness or our mood. Let's take, for example, our relationships with people, our friends, our family, our, even our spouses, right? Now, if I make my wife my sole source of joy in the world, then from time to time, you know, I'll be let down. And vice versa, if my wife makes me her sole source of, sole source of joy, <laughs> she will be let down because we are imperfect, sinful people. We're going to mess up. So many times I'll say the wrong thing and feelings are hurt, or vice versa. And trust me, if you've been around me long enough and you get to know me, sooner or later I'm probably going to say something stupid. Hopefully it's not up here. <laughs> Hopefully it's about a donut or something, you know. But it will happen. It's not a gift. At least it's not a gift from God. But I have a knack for it. Um, and it's the same for our friends and family, right? Sooner or later, something will be said, something will happen, and that relationship's going to go right off the rails, right off the track. You might have problems with your car, or money could be an issue. Problems in your marriage, business, or even problems in ministry. But these things should never rob us of our joy because there's a bigger picture. There's Jesus, right? Always with us, always loves us. He is our joy eternal and our joy everlasting. And God showed me this in a big way a number of years ago. Um, my mom suddenly took ill and what we thought was something minor, ended up to be something that was terminal. She never regained consciousness after her surgery. And um, the very next day she went to, went to go be with the Lord. There wasn't any time for goodbyes, but there will be time for hellos. There wasn't, um, besides my wife, she was my biggest supporter, always rooting me on throughout my life. And the very next day in my devotional, and I'm really not kidding about this, I was in Psalm 30, verse 5b that says, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Amen. Do we have an awesome God or what? There's no such thing as randomness in God's kingdom. There's no such word. Throw the word coincidence right out of your vocabulary. These things are ordained by God. It's like whatever or whenever we go through something, God, who is our joy, is always with us. And it's amazing to see how God changes our lives, changes our joy, our direction, from a worldly one to a heavenly one. Now, when I was growing up, and even up to maybe about 18 years ago, I was always totally affected by the sports teams I rooted for. Now, being from Southern California, you know, it was the Dodgers and the Rams and the Lakers and, and uh, you know, those kind of things. Um, and I know I'm in Arizona, so bear with me here. But, uh, 
anyway, when my team would win or win the title, I would be ecstatic. I'd be in a great mood for a month. But if they lost, man, you don't even want to be around me. You know, <laughs> I let my whole personality take on whatever my team was doing. I was so, I'm a, I'm a big LA Kings fan, hockey fan, still am. Um, and I used to be so affected when the Kings used to lose that my wife, and she will testify to this, I couldn't even be in the same room with her. I'd have to go into another room. I couldn't even, I couldn't even speak to her. I was so upset. But 16 years ago, I found Jesus. And he started to do a work within me. And a lot of you have the same, some similar stories. In 2012, the Kings began their historic run to the Stanley Cup Finals. Before that, they had a series with Arizona. And I was driving back and forth. My son was driving back and forth and sharing this with my kids. And it was a great time. And it was just an awesome experience. You know, we waited 45 years, you know, for this to happen. And, um, and when we played... Uh, that game that clinched it. My oldest son and I were at that game. Uh, and as the clock started to tick down and victory was assured, something different was happening to me. So my cheering, I mean, the crowd was going nuts, right? Finally, it's happened. My cheering and enthusiasm was a lot more subdued than I expected. 20 years ago, I'd have been out of my mind, you know, just cheering my team on. Finally, it's happened, you know? And, but as things started to get near the end, I was so aware of Jesus at that moment. Really was. And, and as happy as I was, or even, you know, I say joyful, you know, there, there's a bigger picture and there's a bigger joy. The things that used to matter just don't seem to matter that much anymore. You know, it, it, it's not that important. That's because I have a joy in my life that I never had before. Psalm 16, 11a says, You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore the path of life, fullness of joy. Um, God was and is showing me the path of life. I remember in my first church where I got saved, I remember someone coming up and giving a testimony about a, a place called uh, Camp Allendale. And for those of you who may not be familiar with that, it's in the town of Idlewild, like in the Palm Spring Mountains. Um, and that sounds funny when you say that. Um, but it was really near there. And it, Camp Allendale is a camp for abused kids. Now, during this testimony, the Holy Spirit really grabbed my heart and gave me a love for his kids that I never had before. You know, I mean, you love your kids, right? But, you know, you're never going to have that same feeling for other kids. And even though we're supposed to love one another, I understand all that. But it was like a thunderbolt, you know, and you know what I'm talking about. And when God really speaks to you, it's like, boom. You know, it doesn't happen all the time, but it happened then. And I knew that somehow or somewhere I was going to be serving children, which was crazy to me. I mean, I, I, here I am, I'm in my 40s. My kids are in their 20s. Uh, children's ministry is a young man's game for people who have kids, you know. But it didn't make any sense to me. Short time later, I started serving in the children's ministry. And then we ended up being directors for about six years. And um, we've been serving the Lord ever since, and we've never, ever looked back. And now there's nowhere else I want to be. There's no, I mean, I, if you place me in the children's ministry for the rest of my life, I'm going to be a happy guy. Um, the verse that comes to mind, of course, is a very popular verse. 3 John 4, I have no greater joy than to hear my children walk in the truth. 
And I got my junior high kids, my crew is over there today. And um, believe me, the next couple of years, I'm, we're really excited to see what the Lord's going to do. And, uh, and this verse means so much to me for that. I have no greater joy than to hear that these kids walk in the truth. And that's not unique. Every teacher here feels the same way. But um, it's just, it's not a volunteer thing. It's, it, it, the Lord has given us a passion for this. He's given us a love for this. He's given us a joy to be able to serve these children. Now, John may have written it, but you can hear our Lord's voice in every word. And as long as I figure I got a few marbles kicking around here, you know, I'm going to pray to continue the work the Lord began. So when we think of beginnings, when we think of things that the Lord starts to do, speaking of uh, joy and beginnings, we remember that night in Bethlehem when joy first came into the world. Now we sing about it every Christmas season, right? Joy to the world, the Lord has come. And I'm not going to sing it for you. Believe me. I might have Caleb sing it for you. But no, I'm not going to sing it. You don't want me to get up and walk out. We remember Luke's gospel that says, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. Now, last week, Pete also shared about how the Supreme Court in 1962 banned school prayer. And I was shocked. I had no idea that was that far back. I figured, you know, 82, 92, something like that. You, could, you can see that. But 62, I was really shocked. But then now the story I'm going to tell you makes complete sense because um, there was a guy that was developing his cartoon strip uh, and producing it into an animated feature. And the network executives were saying, you can't put the Bible on TV. You, you can't do this. And the guy says, well, we're either going to do it my way or we're just going to forget the whole thing. So the network backed down, because you can't stop God's word, right? The network backed down. The guy stood his ground. And the guy's name was Charles Schultz. And a Charlie Brown Christmas was the thing that we're talking about, the thing that he developed. He defended the gospel. And he said, it's either going to be the gospel or nothing. We're not going to cut it out. And twice a year, 54 years later, Twice a season they put it on now. Millions get to see Luke's gospel and how the character Linus tells Charlie Brown that's the meaning of Christmas, right? That's the true meaning of Christmas. And it's an awesome thing that someone stood his ground and look what the Lord has done. Um, I think Rick shared with me something, uh, parables of peanuts. And there's a lot of biblical stuff in that comic strip and uh, something to look up. Millions of people every year get to see this. So as we begin to close, I want to reflect on what Paul said in Acts 20, 24. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I have received from the Lord, Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God to finish my race with joy. <clears throat> Finishing the race for and with Jesus. And we're reminded of the parable of the talents. That was too much to put on there. Um, and not holding on to them. Receiving talents or gifts, but investing in them. And we talked about serving again, you know, and it's like whatever gift that you have, you know, we need it. The church needs it. Because we need to be investing our time into God's kingdom and then watching that bear fruit. Whatever ministry you're in, whatever ministry God would desire you to be in, let's not hide the gift we have been given, but use it for God's glory and let it bear fruit. For we all desire to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Oh, and here's these words, man. Enter into the joy of your Lord. 
Ah, oh, that's what I want to hear. And then I want to see my mom right after that. So uh, right now I'd like to ask the music ministers to come forward. And as they do, uh, a little earlier in the beginning I referred to something that happened to me while we were in California. As we were packing to leave, uh, I set my notebook full of my junior high studies and even this study for today, which I had completed like a couple weeks ago, put it on top of the car. Well, you can imagine what happened. <laughs> there was even some guy in a car next to me pointing back this way, and I'm thinking, what? My brake lights or something? It never occurred to me. So I forgot about it, and somewhere along Pacific Coast Highway, there are pages and pages of Bible studies all over the place. But, you know, God's word never returns void. My prayer now is that somebody picks that up and reads it, and maybe they'll find themselves at church, and maybe they'll get saved. Right? Uh, Ron Crandall over here, uh, uh, being the ex-policeman he, he was, is convinced that there's probably a warrant out for me for littering. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going back there at the end of September, and if you don't see me by the 1st of October, you'll know he's right. <laughs> but you know what? Bring it on, right? Paul was thrown in jail. Many of them were thrown in jail for the word of God. And hey, if that's what it takes to save a soul, so be it. It'll be another testimony and another Bible study. But at that time that it happened, I was really upset. And I thought I was upset because I, I treasure these Bible studies. I, I never throw anything away. You should see, I got a filing cabinet full of stuff I've done over the last 15 years. I don't, I don't like to throw away God's word. I may never look to it again because I want every study to be unique. I don't want to copy what I've done before. But I just don't want to throw it away, you know. They mean so much. And I thought, that's, is that what's happening here? But, you know, you got the enemy whispering in your ear. Wasn't that a complete waste of time? All that scattered all over the highway. Never to be found again. See what a waste of time it was to be with the Lord? That's what the enemy's saying. But you got God in your other ear saying, you know what? Is time with me ever a waste? It is never a waste. Time in God's word is treasure. So as we entered Arizona, because it took me 300 or plus miles to finally get over it, I'm getting faster. It used to take me a week. Now it's just 300 miles. So I'm getting closer. It's getting there. I like to be 300 feet, you know, <laughs> but it hasn't happened yet. But anyway, we're in Arizona, and I want to show you a few things that we saw. Um, God started showing me some things. Off to our left was a blanket of rain with a rainbow coming out of it. You can't really probably see the rainbow in that, but there was, believe me, coming right out of the middle of it. And to our right was a cloud, just drenched in pink, reflecting the falling sun. Behind us, right there, was the sun setting with curtains of rain interspersed between the sun's rays. It really looked better when you were there. Ahead of us, and I'm going to go back one, it was a darkening sky, but as you can see in the middle, it was a formation of light forming, forming the perfect V. Caleb sung earlier about the victory we have in Jesus, right? That's the first thing that came to my mind, V for victory. And Jesus came to be among us, to die on the cross, to give us a way of fellowshipping with him. God was giving me all these pictures as if to remind me, hey, I'm still here. Your joy is still here. I haven't gone anywhere. I've always been there. And now, we get to spend even more time together. And that is joy, my friends. Would you please stand with me? Father, I pray that I've done your words justice today, Lord. 
pray that you have given this message, Lord, that you've given me to share, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone here, Lord, that, that feels that their joy has been robbed or their heart is, is empty, Lord, that you would fill it today. That you would bring the joy back to them, Lord, because, you know, it was never missing in the first place. But we've letting things get in the way. We've let the world interrupt us. We've, we've let the world take over, and we've forgotten where our joy's at. And so, Lord, I just pray, Father, that you would return that joy, and we would not leave here without it. Maybe you're here for the first time. Uh, please don't leave here without prayer. We have elders here that would love to pray with you. Or you can find someone next to you. Um, we want to make sure that you know where your joy is at. And uh, with that, uh, we close. And why don't we give the Lord a hand today, huh? Yeah. As Pastor Joe says, go out and give him Jesus. You guys have a blessed week. Prayer meeting tonight, 630.